So, folk, we are continuing with our series where we have been looking at mastermind and the way we take control of the battle of our minds and the verse that we have been looking at for the last six or so weeks is verse 4 of chapter 10 of 1, 2 Corinthians. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds, and we define a stronghold as a prison, a fortress, something that holds us captive. And Paul says, we demolish strongholds and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And that is what the series has been all about, is mastering our minds of taking captive every thought in obedience to Christ. The, the strongholds that we face today are probably greater than ever. Uh, we've been looking at a stronghold of guilt. Uh, last week we looked at the stronghold of anxiety and fear and worry. And this morning we are going to be looking at a, a topic that is a very difficult topic, and yet it is probably one of the, most, the strongest strongholds that the human race face today. It is the stronghold of sexual impurity. And I really am asking this morning that we would try and keep our attention on what we're going to be dealing with. Uh, this coming week, I'm away at conference in Cape Town, so I couldn't try and do this over two weeks as we did with guilt. And so I felt it important for us to deal with the subject in one sitting, and therefore we'll spend a little bit longer than normal on it. So please just bear with us. But I really believe that God wants to speak to us through His Word today and challenge us in a number of areas of sexual impurity. Joshua Harris, who I'll be quoting a few times this morning, wrote a book entitled, Sex is Not the Problem, Lust Is. He writes of how a girl called Chelsea, who found herself trapped in a web of masturbation and pornography, wrote to him. He says her letter is typical of the desperation and the frustration of so many today. She wrote, I don't know who I am anymore. I'm so scared. I do what I know is wrong. I've tried to stop. Really, I have. I've cried and sobbed at night. I've prayed and kept journals. I've read books. I'm honestly at a loss. I love God, but I cannot continue to ask for forgiveness over and over and over for the same thing. I know I need help, but I don't know how to get it. I know that God has so much more planned for my life than this but this sin continues to conquer me. I wonder if you can identify with Chelsea's anguish this morning. And Joshua Harris goes on to write, you try and try, but it never seems to be enough. Is there anything more discouraging than losing the fight against lust and sexual impurity? It saps your spiritual passion. It makes your faith feel hollow. It stifles prayer. It colors your whole view of your walk with God. At moments, you're so overwhelmed by shame that God seems a million miles away. Is this what God intended for us? Chelsea is right. God does have so much more planned for us than a life that is dominated by lust, guilt, and shame. I think many people today mistaken, are mistaken in thinking that God is opposed to sex. But He is not. He is pro-sex. In fact, He invented it. God said in Genesis... Go out and be fruitful and multiply. And almost so that we would not get slack in that task, He gave us the ability to be sexual creatures, wired 
with this incredible gift that we call sexual drive. Harris writes, Jesus did not come to rescue us from humanity, but he entered into our humanity to rescue us from our sinfulness. He didn't come to save us from being sexual creatures. He became one of us to save us from the reign of sin and lust that ruins sexuality. And so this morning, the passage I want to read is from a passage from the Sermon on the Mount, from Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. And the subtitle is Adultery. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. I wonder if we could just pray and just pray for God's anointing on His Word today. Lord, I just pray that as we share Your Word, as we speak into this difficult subject, that You would open our hearts to receive. But more than that, Lord, that we would take Your Word seriously today, that we would go out and be doers of this Word, that we might bring glory to Your name. And so anoint Your Word, Lord. Hide me behind Your cross, Lord. And may only Jesus be before us, speaking into our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So some people would say Jesus here is speaking out against sexual desire. They claim that sexual desire or finding someone sexually attractive or physically attractive is wrong. And if you do, you're going to hell. I want to say that this cannot be further from the truth. If you study the Scriptures, you find that there is no way the Bible is negative about sexual desire. In fact, if I had to read some of the passages about sex and sexual desire to you today, I think some of you would blush. Genesis 2, we read that God brings Eve to Adam and when he does that, in her nakedness, he bursts out in song and he declares this love song over his wife. Here is Adam singing naked this rapturous love song over his naked wife. How many of you guys have done that? <laughs> Don't answer. There's a passage in Proverbs 6. In fact, the whole of Proverbs 6 is a, is a very um, sensuous passage of Scripture. I remember very tactfully avoiding chapter 6 when we dealt with Proverbs in our study of Proverbs because it is so graphic. But Solomon says a husband ought to be ravished with his wife's breasts. You hear that, guys? You ought to be ravished with your wife's breasts. Not now. <laughs> okay. Now, that's pretty explicit, isn't it? You know, you can't get around that one. The whole Song of Solomon is a beautiful and graphic celebration of the glory of sexual love within marriage. There's no way the Bible is opposed to the idea of sexual desire. And as the title of that book implies, sex is not the problem, lust is. It's the enemy who has hijacked sexuality and so... We need to rescue our sexuality from lust so that we can experience it in the way that God intended. And we'll come back to this. We cannot address the subject of adultery or sexual impurity without saying something about marriage as the only sanctuary in which God permits sexual desire and intimacy. 
Jesus starts by saying, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. And then he goes on and says, but I say unto you. In other words, Jesus is accepting the Old Testament law that one should not commit adultery, which is always understood in the Old Testament as sex outside of the marriage covenant. And I want to say, friends, the word covenant is not as archaic as you may think it is. It is far more than just a loving relationship. It is more binding and enduring than a a mere emotional relationship. It is a legal relationship. Tim Keller talks about there being a huge difference between a consumer relationship and a covenant relationship. You see, in a consumer relationship you relate to a supplier or a vendor and as long as the vendor is giving you a product at a good price and it's a good product, it's okay, your relationship is intact. But you're always looking for something better, you're always looking for an upgrade. And so you say to your vendor, I will maintain our relationship as long as you supply me with what I want. If you don't meet my needs, I'm going to find somebody else. I'm out of here. Because my needs are more important than our relationship. A covenant relationship is exactly the opposite. A consumer relationship says, you are just to me or I'm out of here. A covenant relationship says, I will adjust to you because I've made a promise And my relationship with you is more important than my needs. And so if you get into a relationship and you are both not covenanting, it is open to abuse and manipulation and exploitation. You see, there are two outcomes of being in a covenant relationship, friends. The first outcome is you finally have a zone of safety. A place where you can be yourself. In a consumer relationship, you are always marketing, always selling yourself. You've got to perform. You have to meet the other person's need, otherwise they're out of here. In a covenant relationship of marriage, You can drop the mask. You can stop marketing or selling yourself. And you can just be yourself. Secondly, in a covenant relationship, ironically, when you are committed to a person, in spite of your feelings, your feelings grow even deeper. When you're in a covenant relationship and in spite of your feelings and there are times when you may even, in inverted commas, hate the other person because of something has happened and you work through that and you wrestle with that and you win through and you reconcile your feelings towards the other person are even stronger. That never happens in a consumer relationship. So you say, well, why is this relevant and how is this relevant to sex? Simply because the Bible never views sex as a consumer good. It's a covenant good. Sex is a consumer good when it is used to satisfy me, to make me feel good about myself, to make me feel loved and accepted. And so I will go out and find somebody who can meet that need in me. But the Bible says sex was not designed to be a consumer good. It was designed to be a covenant good. In a covenant, when you've made a promise, sex becomes like a sacrament. Now we share in the sacrament of Holy Communion. What is a sacrament? It's a visible sign of an invisible reality. It's a symbol. That is why it is so meaningful and precious when you explore sex within that covenant. 
because it becomes the vehicle for engaging the whole person. It is an act of self-giving and self-commitment. When you have sex, you are completely physically naked, exposed and vulnerable. And thereby you are saying to your partner within the covenant of marriage that I am also emotionally, spiritually exposed and naked with you. It is an act of self-giving. It is the most intimate way to give your entire self to another person. Yet sex outside of marriage, you are asking someone to do with their body what they are not prepared to do with the rest of their lives. They can opt out at any point when their needs are not being satisfied or when they get tired of you. They will start looking for an upgrade. And sex becomes merely a consumer good. And it was never God's intention for it to be that way. So let's come back to the word that Jesus uses in this verse, verse 28. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery. This is an unusual word used in relation to sex. And when you look at the original Greek, it actually is translated with a strong association with idolatry, and in particular, greed. Hear me now. So what we need to do is, rather than look at sex, let's rather look at greed. There's nothing wrong with money, is there? There's nothing wrong with wealth. The Bible doesn't speak out against money or against wealth. Abraham and Job and Solomon were all incredibly wealthy. Money isn't the problem, friends. Greed is. Sex is not the problem. Lust is. And so with greed, the first thing we understand about greed is it's a desire to have money for selfish reasons. Greed is wanting more and more for yourself. You're not prepared to share it. It's for me. Secondly, greed is addictive. Often wealthy people want more and more and more. They are never satisfied with what they have. They are always looking at ways of finding more, and they'll use any corrupt means to do so. They'll exploit others and undermine others to get what they want at all costs. So firstly, greed is a desire for selfish reasons. Greed is addictive. And then thirdly, they fantasize about it. Hear me now. They fantasize about it. One way of knowing whether you are greedy, and this is the very crux of our whole series, is what do you find yourself thinking about and dreaming about the most? Remember, your life moves in the direction of what you think and dream about the most. That is why you've got to take those thoughts captive. Greedy people are always thinking and fantasizing about what they might have if they could do this or that. But that's greed. So what is Jesus saying here? Because he uses this word in terms of adultery. So what is he saying? He's saying it is possible to have an idolatrous attitude towards money and to have that same idolatrous attitude towards sex. And this is exactly what we're sharing with some of the young adults last Sunday night. Idolatry. It is possible, friends, for sexual desire when used selfishly for it to become addictive for it to, to occupy your thoughts, to fantasize, and to, for it to dominate your thoughts to such an extent that it becomes an idol in your life. 
and you start looking at sex and sexual desire as a means of giving you what you believe God cannot give you. It takes the place of God. That's idolatry. You see, the Pharisees understood the Old Testament very well. The seventh commandment, they could quote all ten commandments, and they had hundreds of laws and regulations to govern those commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Oh, they understood that only too well. In fact, the Old Testament law said the punishment for adultery was death. Surely such a severe punishment highlights the holiness of God and the sanctity of marriage. But an adulterer does more than just sin against his wife. This is more than just breaking a rule or a law. An adulterer destroys the very picture that God gave his people to showcase his marriage relationship with them. You see, in the Old Testament, God always spoke of himself as being a husband and Israel as being the bride. And when God's people decided to worship other gods and idols, God labeled them as adulterers. He could use this language because marriage is more than a union between a man and a woman. It's a stunning picture of God's faithfulness to His people. And when people turn away from God and they turn to other lovers, they are nothing less than adulterers or idolaters. God calls for sexual purity because marriage is supposed to be an earthly pattern, model, picture of God's faithfulness with His bride. And when we violate that in the physical realm, we are violating that picture of divine fidelity. Lust goes beyond attraction and appreciation of beauty. Lust even goes beyond a healthy desire for sex. It makes these desires more important than God. It is idolatrous because it is seeking a satisfaction outside of God. And so the word lust used elsewhere in Scripture often means to crave sexually what God has forbidden. Here now. To crave sexually what God has forbidden. To lust is what is to want what you do not have and you were never intended to have. And so Harris gives five things that lust is not. And it's in your notes for those of you who have it, and we can always make more for those of you who don't. It's not lust to be attracted to someone or notice that he or she is good-looking. It is not lust to have a strong desire to have sex. It is not lust to anticipate and be excited about having sex within your marriage. It is not lust to be turned on without a conscious decision to do so. It's not lust to experience sexual temptation. None of those things are lust. But the crucial thing with each of those examples is how you respond to the desires and urges of your sexual drive. Noticing an attractive person is absolutely normal because that's the way you're wired. But imagining what is underneath And imagining what it would be like if you had them is an entirely different thing. Because that is impure and it is lustful. 
John Piper has given what I think is probably the best description of lust. Listen to this. Lust is a sexual desire minus honor and holiness. Wow, that's just amazing. Lust is a sexual desire minus honor and holiness. When we lust, we take this good thing that God has given, the sexual desire, and we remove from it honor towards the opposite sex. And we remove from it reverence toward a holy God. You objectify the opposite sex. You see, the Bible says, Thou shalt not covet. Lust says exactly the opposite. In fact, lust says what you don't have, you ought to have. It's exactly what you need. In other words, lust covets the forbidden. The verse that I was sharing with the young adults last week is from James 1, 13 to 14. Listen to this. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But listen now. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And then James says, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Jesus said in Matthew 15, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality. Out of the heart. You can't blame the devil. You can't say the devil made me do this. It is out of the heart. It is because of our own evil desire that we are lured away and enticed. Now, so far, what we have said is, you might have thought it's okay, so far, so good. I'm handling this. But now we get on to the real difficult stuff. And I don't just address this to men, I address this to everybody, because this is as much a problem among women as it is among men. Because there are many things that can feed lust in our lives. And probably the the most prolific, the greatest scourge of our times, given the, the increase in technology and social media and the internet and so on, is the whole area of pornography. Now let me just say and remind you of what sex is not. It is not a consumer good. It's for giving, for serving, not for receiving, not for your own self-fulfillment. And yet pornography is so completely and utterly focused on self, you don't even need another person. You can have it whenever, however you want it. Let me give you some frightening stats. Porn is a $13 billion a year industry even more than Hollywood itself. One study revealed that more than 45 million individuals visited a particular porn site in one month. 45 million in one month. That was their hit rate. Another study shows that 90% of teenagers between the ages of 8 and 16 have visited porn sites online. Isn't that frightening? 90%. Between 8 and 16. You say, well, perhaps among Christians it's a lot better. It's not much better. 
In a survey by the Barna Institute in the U.S., it showed that among Christians, 24% of them looked at porn daily. Their research, in fact, showed that 51% of pastors admitted that pornography was a possible temptation. 37% said porn is a struggle, and 33% said they had viewed porn at least once in the last year. Friends, it's a scourge of our society. It's at the very root of what's going on in our own country. Gender violence doesn't just happen. It starts somewhere. And it starts with lust. And lust begins so often with pornography. Is it any wonder that the addiction expert Gerald May calls this, and I quote, the most powerful psychic enemy of humanity's desire for God, end quote. The most powerful psychic enemy of humanity's desire for God. So there's a writer by the name of Michael Grigo. He wrote an article, The Christian View of Pornography, in which he gives 18 reasons for not looking at porn. Now, I can't possibly try and go through 18 reasons, but I want to highlight just six with that I believe to be the most crucial. And again, they're in your notes. Reason number one, quite simply, God tells you not to. Over and over again, we read, flee from sexual immorality. Do not be engaged in any kind of sexual impurity. There shouldn't be a hint of sexual immorality among you, and so on. And all the scriptures are there. The one scripture... In fact, is 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18, not 14. And there's a comma between the 3 and 4 of 1 Thessalonians 4. It's 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 and 4, not verse 34. So just correct that if you have notes. So God tells us not to. Secondly, reason number two, and this is important, you cannot simultaneously have a passionate relationship with Christ and be living in sexual sin. If you seek to gratify the desires of the flesh and live only to please yourself, you cannot please God. Listen to what Paul writes. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God, for if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, and you will live. Like Chelsea in the story we read earlier. If you continue in sexual sin, friends, you will remain miserable and ashamed under the weight of your sin. And like Adam, you will scurry around trying to hide from God. Your relationship with God will be destroyed. Reason three and four are flow into each other, and they are so crucial. Porn changes your brain. Some weeks ago, I spoke to you about this drug in our bodies called dopamine. It gives you a thrill when you do something right, or when you, somebody says something good about you, and you, you don't know why you just feel so good. That's dopamine. It's a chemical that is excreted in the brain that basically gives you that feeling of elation and joy. But listen now. Every time you look at pornography, it floods the brain with dopamine, which lays down new neuropathways in your brain. Brain cells become activated when you watch porn. And they release chemicals that help strengthen the connection between the porn and the neurons in your brain. And the more you look at it, the stronger those neuro connections become. And so you just can't stop. But if you do stop, you can rebuild new pathways. 
and find healthy alternatives. Which leads to reason number four, that porn is highly addictive. It is because of this dopamine. Because your brain becomes accustomed to the new levels of dopamine that are flooding through it. Regular activities that would normally set off a burst of dopamine in the brain are now dampened. Because you flooded your brain with dopamine. Instead of a normal sexual act with your partner giving you that that dopamine effect, it's just the mundane. Because your head and brain has been so flooded with dopamine, it just becomes very dull and regular. In fact, you don't even register to any burst of dopamine. And it leaves you with this feeling of emptiness and uneasiness. And the only thing that gets it going again is by looking at pornography. Because when you don't have it, it's like a drug. You don't have a drug, you, go, you have withdrawal symptoms. And that's exactly what happens when you don't have pornography. There's a craving to get back to it. To explore more. And so a tolerance builds up to porn. And looking at naked women is no longer satisfying. And so you go to the next extreme level of explicit sexual activity. What do you do when that no longer satisfies? I was sharing with the early congregation of how there was somebody who was a, in a previous church, was a Sunday school teacher. He was about 29 years old. He met with his children every week, shared the gospel with them. And he told me how he had been addicted to, to Hustler magazine and some of the other magazines out there. And when what he saw in Hustler was no longer satisfying him, he started to, to subscribe to the adverts that were in Hustler magazine. And one was down the road in a man's in Toti. And there was a couple, a woman who put an advert in and said, I want somebody to come and watch me and my, or in fact, not come and watch, I want somebody to come to my home and have sex with my wife this guy said, while I sit in the corner and watch you. And he answered the ad. Sunday school teacher. And he went to their home and they had some wine together. They went off to the room and the husband sat in the corner while he engaged in sex with his wife. Now what takes you to that level of depravity, friend? that you can claim that you're a Christian and you can even serve in the church among children and do such a despicable thing. It's addictive. The dopamine levels are so high that the things that you just watch on the internet are no longer satisfying. You've got to go to the next level. That's doing something as, as radical as that. Reason number five. And I think this is the one that is the crunch for, for many wives today. Porn creates false expectations of normal sexual relationships with your partner. People who use pornography have crushingly unrealistic expectations regarding physical appearance and sexual performance. They become more critical of their partner's appearance, sexual performance, and displays of affection. In fact, porn 
users get so obsessed with chasing something that isn't real. Remember the unforbidden. What was never intended to be theirs. They are so possessed and obsessed by chasing something that's not real, they can't have successful relationships with someone who is real. And they wonder why that the sex within their marriage is not what it should be. Reason number six is what we saw in the video that we watched early on. Marriages with porn problems have less intimacy and sensitivity. And porn increases the likelihood of infidelity like nothing else does. I read of a teenage girl was recalling in a counseling session of her childhood and what it had been like, a childhood that was marred by pornography. And she writes, when I was eight years old, my father made me look at pornographic images involving sex acts that he wanted me to perform with him. I went along with him not knowing any better. And the counselor says, for years, this girl's father raped her while sticking pictures up in front of her. And at the age of 16, she had already contracted a sexually transmitted disease. And she wrote, I may die of this disease, porn, has utterly ruined my life. So much for the claim made by so many porn advocates out there that pornography is a victimless crime. It is not. It is absolutely not. As we see in our own country. So you then ask, well, what is God's standard then? What is God's standard when it comes to lust? How much lust does God want us to, can God allow in our lives? We'll have a look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. Listen to this. Paul writes, but among you, speaking to believers, among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity? The answer is not even a hint. You say, well, gee, that's, isn't that unreasonably strict? I mean, how can God be so strict? This is how He's wired us. How can He, how can he expect that of us? Because He loves us, friends. Because we are His. It's because He is wise and His wisdom exceeds our understanding. He knows what happens when you violate that precious gift that He has given to you. It's not just the sin of adultery and sex outside of marriage God wants us to be freed from. He wants to eliminate all sexual impurity from our lives. See, the problem is we think that if we can just cut back on lust, God will be happy with us. We know it's wrong. We know it makes us feel bad. But after all, it's a soft porn, you know. I don't, I don't do that stuff. I don't look at sexual acts and all that terrible stuff. I only, it's just images that I look at. And we try and condone it and justify it. And all the time our hearts are getting harder and harder and harder. Surely a little won't hurt. It's the melody of youth groups for as long as I can remember. How far can you go? How many youth leaders have had to deal with that question? You see, the Bible teaches that lust is not okay. And He gives us this daunting standard that there should not even be a hint of lust in our heart. So there's no place for lust in our lives, friends, to exist, 
peacefully before God. We've got to fight it on every front. Sexual purity is clearly something only God can bring about in your life and mine. Because God's standard is so high, it brings me to an end of my own ability and willpower to try and and manage this or get, get through this, overcome this. C.S. Lewis, who I've quoted many times before, such an incredible writer. A few weeks ago, we quoted from Pilgrim's Progress with uh, uh, Bunyan. And we quoted Mere Christianity and a couple of other actual books by C.S. Lewis. And all of these ancient writers had so much wisdom. And in The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis tells an allegorical story about a ghost of a man afflicted by lust. Listen to this allegorical story. A ghost of a man afflicted by lust. Lust is incarnated in the form of a red lizard that sits on his shoulder and whispers seductively into his ear. And when the man despairs of the lizard, an angel offers to kill it for him. But the guy is torn between loving his lust and wanting it to die. He fears that the death of the lust will kill him himself. And so he makes excuse after excuse to the angel in an attempt to keep the lizard that he says he doesn't really want. Are you starting to see yourself maybe in this picture? And then finally, the man agrees to let the angel seize and kill the lizard. And the angel grasps the lizard, breaks its neck, and throws it to the ground. And once the spell of lust is broken, the ghostly man is gloriously remade into a real and solid human being. And the lizard, rather than dying, is transformed into a breathtaking stallion. And weeping tears of joy and gratitude, the man mounts the stallion and they soar into the heavens. You see, in that allegory, C.S. Lewis shows the connection between killing our lust and the life that God wants for each of us. Because it feels that if I destroy my lust, it'll destroy me. But you know, it doesn't. When you destroy lustful desire, we come not to the end of desire, but to the beginning of pure desire. God-centered desire, what God blessed us with, what God always intended for His creation. Still with me? So, we're on the downhill now, because now we've got to deal with how to overcome lust and impurity. And folks, I want to say that this is a subject that we could be dealing with over six weeks. <clears throat> and so I don't think for a moment that we have exhausted trying to find remedies for lust. I wish I had more time to spend on this. But perhaps just to say that Jesus gives us a rather ruthless response to lust. He says, pluck out your right eye and cut off your right hand. But let me ask you, if you cut out your right eye and cut off your right hand, would you still be able to lust? Of course you would. Not cutting off your head, 
You're gouging out your eye in your right hand. Now, why does Jesus refer to your right hand and a right eye? Because for the Jew, it was considered to be the best and the strongest. And so what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, whatever you need to eliminate from your life, no matter how strong and how precious and how important you think it is, protect your heart from those desires. Whatever it is that feeds your lust, if it's pornography, then cut it out. If it is looking at magazines, cut it out. If it is listening to stuff, cut it out, Jesus says. You have to be ruthless. Otherwise, this will strangle you. And you will be as, as helpless as Chelsea was in the story. And then Jesus goes on to speak about something very somber, very sobering. He says, rather do that than go with your whole body and be thrown into hell. Now, what is he meaning here? Because surely he's not referring to a literal hell where we'll be cast if we have sexual immorality or impurity in our lives. Because then who could escape? You see, the word Jesus uses here is a word Gehenna, which is one of the images he uses that is used for hell in the Bible. Gehenna was actually a place in Jerusalem. It was where rubbish was, was sent to be burned. And so the use of hell or Gehenna here speaks of a place of unquenchable thirst and unfulfilled longing. Follow me now. Unquenchable thirst and unfulfilled longing. We were created in God's image. We were created to know God. And so Tim Keller writes, and I quote, if we lose God, we lose the ability to have our deepest needs satisfied. And so hell means, among other things, an unfulfilled longing and a deep, unquenchable thirst. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that sex outside of marriage points to that. As does lusting after the flesh. Why? Because sex deceives us when it is not done in the right way that God intended. Sex holds out the promise of such fulfillment and such affirmation and acceptance. And yet, as we've seen outside of marriage, it destroys your ability to really be free. It destroys your ability not to have to, to wear a mask. Not have to try and market yourself and and try and sell yourself over and over again until finally the person gets tired of you and gets an upgrade. As Tim Keller writes, if you're out there having sex, thinking sex is going to give you what you really want, you're a little bit like a person dying of thirst on a raft in the ocean. Water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. And so Jesus says that outside of the covenant of marriage, sex is pointing us toward hell. Unfulfilled longing and deep, unquenchable thirst. Final reference to Scripture, and then we'll conclude. In Romans chapter 7 and Ephesians 5, we are given, and I urge you to read it, the most rapturous sexual love affair between a husband and a wife. And it's, it tells us that that love affair between a husband and a wife is just a dim foretaste, a dim like pointer to what it's going to be like 
when you fall into the arms of your lover at the end of time. Remember what we said. The sexual act of sexual intimacy of a husband and a wife is similar to the very relationship with Christ and His church. The husband and the wife. And when we violate the covenant, we violate the image that God has given to us between Christ and the church. So when Jesus was talking to the women at the well in John chapter 4, He said to her, I've got water that if you drink it, you will never thirst again. In other words, I have water that will satisfy your deepest needs and your unfulfilled longings. And she says, give me this water. Almost misinterpreting what Jesus is saying. What does Jesus say? He says, bring me your husband. What's that got to do with drinking water from a well? Bring me your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. Thinking she's got away with it. And he says, indeed you don't have a husband. In fact, you have five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. Now, why does Jesus start to drag up all her messed up sex life to make a point? Because what Jesus is saying, friends, is that I can satisfy your longings. All the time you've been trying to satisfy your longings in men. And I am the only one that can satisfy your longings and your needs. Anything that you use, anything that you do, to find satisfaction or fulfillment outside of Jesus, friends, is idolatry. It's adultery. And it points us straight to hell. I want to conclude with this two excerpts from Joshua Harris. And it's in your notes and you can follow if you have your notes with you. If you ever expect to find victory over lust, you must believe with your whole heart that God is against your lust, not because He is opposed to pleasure, but in fact because He's so committed to it. I've learned that I can only fight lust in the confidence of my total forgiveness before God because of Jesus' death for me. My guilt and shame, even self-inflicted punishment, can never cleanse me. Even my good works can't bury, can't buy my forgiveness. I need a savior, I need grace. Author Jerry Bridges says it best. I love this quote. Every day of our Christian experience should be a day of relating to God on the basis of His grace alone. Now listen to this. Your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace. And your best days are never so good that you are beyond the need of God's grace. Sexual purity is clearly something only God can bring about in your life and mine. And then lastly, God's standard of not even a hint, quickly brings me to the end of my own ability and effort. It reminds me that God's standard is so much higher than the standards I place for myself that only the victory of Christ's death and resurrection can provide the right power and the right motive needed to change me. Willpower won't work. Only the power of the cross can break the power of sin 
that keeps us on this treadmill. Despair or pride that I can change won't work either. Only the motive of grace. Trust in the undeserved favor of God can inspire us to pursue holiness free from fear and shame. And so, friends, as we conclude, how are you doing in this whole area of sexual purity? What occupies your thoughts day by day? What are the things that you spend your life looking at that you know you shouldn't be? It's not about sex. It's all about lust. Now I'm aware that this is a very personal and private thing. And I'm aware that it is something that every single person here needs to wrestle with with God. And I invite you to take those notes and explore those scriptures and to go through that material again as inadequate as it is to get a handle on the stronghold that is taking captive so many people today. It's crippling the church. How many churches have been destroyed through infidelity and sexual scandal? And yet at the same time, we are all aware of how easy it is to cross that line. I don't think anybody can judge anybody else who has. Because within each of us, we know there's that propensity, that, that, that ability, that potential to cross that line. Remember, the Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But Paul says, shall we carry on sinning that grace may abound? And he says, God forbid, God forbid, What you've got to do is you've got to root it out. You've got to get rid of it. You've got to gouge your eye out. You've got to cut off your hand. In other words, you have to be ruthless in dealing with the stronghold. Otherwise, it will remain in your life until the day you die. So friends, if ever there's a time that I'm asking you to take God's Word seriously, If ever there's a time I'm asking you to be a doer of God's word, it is today. Because it is such a powerful force in the hands of the enemy against the church of Jesus Christ. And unless we face it on all fronts, unless we are vigilant and alert, The enemy will destroy you. The enemy will destroy your marriage and your family. Destroy your community. And as he's trying to do now, destroy our country. May God give us his grace to overcome the stronghold. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. I ask you just to be quiet before the Lord right now. And in the silence, to just examine your own sexual purity. You know, as God knows, those areas where you have crossed the line 
where you have dabbled, where you, you have poured your eyes upon things that you should not have. And it's been destroying your very soul. Won't you bring that before the Lord this morning? Won't you come to this God who does not condemn? But even as he said to the adulterous woman, go and sin no more. Father God, you know our hearts. Our hearts that are desperately wicked above all things. For out of our hearts come adultery and immorality, impurity. Guard our hearts, O Lord. Help us to be vigilant in this area, Lord. Help us not to put ourselves in compromising positions or situations. Help us to find someone who we can be accountable to if we are struggling in this area. Help us to come clean that we might indeed understand the pureness of this gift that you have given to us. I pray, Lord God, for every marriage here this morning. Pray that you would strengthen marriages. I pray, Lord, for every young person this morning who have been unfortunate enough to grow up in a world where there is so much media and so much stuff that is so readily available that entices and seduces and draws them away from you. And I pray, Lord, that today they would say no and make that stand on your word and determine today to be pure in their sexuality. We pray again, Lord, for our country and the sexual violence that has been the scourge of our nation in recent weeks and months and probably years. And it all begins with what we've been talking about today. And so again, we pray for ourselves. Deliver us, Lord. Help us to take hold of your grace and to stand firm in your word. To take captive every thought and to replace it with thoughts that are good and pure and noble and right and praiseworthy. As Paul tells us in Philippians 4. We cry out for your help, Lord. In this, one of the strongest battles of the mind. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.